It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into our new and fresh Thursday show. I'm your host, Kevin Misery, here with our new co-host for Locked On Bills, Nick Woten. He is a beat reporter over the Buffalo football beat. Uh, we're glad to have Nick as he is coming over as our new Thursday guy, uh, replacing uh, Nick, uh, Nate Geary's Wednesday show. So we're really happy to have him. You know, today we're going to be talking a little bit about receiver, uh, getting in the tight end for a brief moment, going to be getting into what's going on with the Bills. Are they really considering a trade-up? Really hot topic right now. So I wanted to, to touch on that a little bit here in this jam-packed Thursday show. Nick, how are you doing today? Kevin, I'm great, and of course, uh, thanks for having me. I'm really, uh, really honored and really happy to have, uh, uh, of course, joining you on Lockdown and uh, at Buffalo Football Beat. You guys got to check out some of uh, Kevin's stuff that he's contributing to uh, my site. It's been been real good so far, Kevin, so uh, I'm I'm glad that we're linking in on some stuff here. Nice. Thanks, Nick. And check out our mocks going live tomorrow over there. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit about some trade-ups. Nick's a little bit more aggressive than I am. Um, but also, we want you guys to check out our other lockdown shows, draft shows. Great. Um, those guys spend all day, every day, recording and talking about the draft. So really good time to check out the lockdown edition over there. As always, check out the other uh, lockdown shows in terms of lockdown Browns, lockdown 49ers. If there's a certain position you think we might be trading up to, check out their um, Locked on host and see if what they're thinking over there is gotten to a few discussions today and yesterday about that. Really wanted to touch on receiver here first, Nick. Um, I think that there's a major hole at this position group, one that they're egregiously not making a move for. Like, what's your initial reaction on the Bills receiver group and like, what are they doing there? Well, my initial reaction is uh, Mr. Uh, Colton Schmidt lover and Kevin over here is only calling it a major concern. Kevin, this is. I think this is bigger. I'm surprised in you. I think this is bigger than a major concern. Punter's a major concern. <laughs> Punter is the major concern, of course. No, he's no Marquette King, but we'll get. But who just signed with Denver? But that's another story. Yes, of course. But um, yeah, Kevin, uh, you said it right there on a, on a serious note. It is a very uh, major need here. We have Kelvin Benjamin. Um, obviously, he's going to be the go-to for whomever is throwing the football for the Buffalo Bills in 2018. Maybe AJ. Maybe Nate, maybe fill in the blank. But uh, Kelvin Benjamin's going to have to play a huge role. Um, obviously got nicked up pretty early in his Bills career last year. Um, at this point, you got to lean on him. Um, he's going to have to carry the, the load out there, um, this big six foot five frame. And I think, Kevin, they're going to have to lean a lot on Zay Jones, too. And, of course, we don't have to rehash everything that went on with him. But um, – I think going into the year before everything happened with uh, Zane and his brother out in that apartment in Los Angeles, I think the Bills were going to lean on him and hope for a better second year. And you see that a lot with wide receivers, even the top name guys, very few wide receivers come in and light the world on fire in their first year. Zay, of course, had his struggles with some drops, um, now some off field things. So I think those two guys, easy to say now, but in the draft, Kevin, depending on any potential trade up with which I think we're going to, speak about in a little bit um the bill's got to use a pick maybe even two on a wide receiver yeah and zay jones is a guy they traded up to 37 last year uh that's not you know it's easy to kind of think like oh late second or something i mean he's not he's an early second round pick a uh, guy that you're honestly looking for a little bit more production even year one um and you didn't really get it and uh, obviously receivers do develop um as they can and even even way later in their careers as you you see with a guy like brandon lloyd or uh, Ted Ginn, some of these guys that really do take a while to develop with a lot of talent. But Zay Jones, you, right now they're banking a lot on him that they have him as their number two receiver and as well as an injured Kelvin Benjamin last year. So you have two guys with major question marks. Do you – I just – I can't trust it. Like I just still think, uh, as you mentioned, we'll get into in a little bit here, trading up and you're trading three or four assets or more, uh, maybe even 2019 assets if you have to, to get a quarterback – and you are giving this new quarterback, uh, Zay Jones and Calvin Benjamin, you know, two fine possession receivers, each good at a little bit different of a role. But aren't we like drastically missing someone that can stretch the field? Aren't we drastically missing like a safety net? Or would you kind of consider Zay Jones that? What is Zay Jones? Yeah, Zay Jones, I think you described it well there, is, is a possession guy. I mean, he's built just like an athletic freak when you, when you see him in the locker room and that sort of thing. Uh, it's sort of a... 
with the position, if you will. I mean, to be a wide receiver, even a couple of years ago, the Bills had quite a few track athletes. And it's really been weird, Kevin. I don't know about you, but really it seems like even going back years to, um, I don't know, different drafts, you, you say the Bills need a wide receiver in this draft, but they need that big guy. Now they got too many big guys almost. Not that Zay is a big guy, but he's 6'2", 6'3". He's not a short guy. He's not a Mark, Marquise Goodwin. Um, but the Bills had Goodwin. The Bills had Woods. The Bills had Watkins just a year or two ago. These guys, 4x4 four four relay, you're throwing them on there. The Bills might win that in the NFL maybe two years ago. And yeah, sure. I mean, and, I mean guy, especially Robert Woods. Like, he was not as slow as people thought. Like, he was the fastest possession receiver I've ever seen, personally. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he was for you, – you said it right there again, the possession receiver. That's just the way kind of – his route running, if you will, maybe with Robert Woods, the way he played the position. But, I mean, when you gave him some open field, I mean, he showed last year in, in Los Angeles that uh, he, he can do quite some damage. And he had a 100-yard game, too, with the Bills as well uh, when they had to rely on him. I think that was against Seattle, if my yes. is, uh, correct. Um, of course, my memory is correct. Thank you, Kevin. You're welcome. That's, uh, yeah, I think maybe depending on the way the draft falls, um, again, with picks, I mean, the first guy that comes to mind for me would be James Washington of Oklahoma State. I don't know where the Bills are going to be, depending on, again, if they trade up. I mean, he's just probably this big speedster that comes to mind for me in the draft right now. As far as free agency is concerned, I mean, we're talking on uh, Jordan Matthews' departure night. Of course, he wasn't a speedster. He was, again, another possession guy. So I think that's probably why you're seeing Jordan Matthews go. Of course, he battled some injuries last year, never really got his footing. And I think also – Sort of backtracking Kevin over to Zay Jones. Not to, you know, cry over spilt milk, beat a dead horse. Tyrod Taylor was throwing the football last year, so maybe there is a little bit more if the Bills get a better passer back there that we can see out of Zay Jones. Yeah, definitely. And you see a little bit of a, a major a major hole at the at the position group. Just in general, like, okay, so let's let's play uh, for fun. We're going to say Zay Jones is a number two, Calvin's a number one. Great. You still don't have anything else. Um, you still don't have a, the ability to go three wide, go four wide. Like, I just don't know what the team has right now. Kalen Clay is a pure fifth or sixth guy that, you know, you're, you're using as a punt returner. Um, I'm actually not too mad. They signed him as, you know, fifth or sixth guy. I thought he was just starting to show a little bit and then they cut him, um, you know, weirdly enough for Deontay Thompson, who they decided not to uh, re-sign. So I think the Bills took a kind of hit there. I think they probably offered the same amount of money uh, that Dallas did. Uh, he, you know, chose to go with a more stable quarterback position um, over there and 2.5 to go to go to Dallas. But Jeremy Macklin, I mean, he's a guy that I think adds a different dynamic. I don't know what he can offer in terms of how many catches per year he's going to give you, but I think he's a guy I like. The team loved him last year, Nick. Um, they were willing to give him three, four, five, six last, depending on what you want to say. And, you know, I don't know how uh, badly they were outbe- uh, outbid by Baltimore, but he's cut again. He's there. There's no way they just stopped liking him. He didn't do much worse than he did in, uh, in Kansas City the year prior. So do you give the guy a $3 million deal and say, hey, come be our third receiver? Yeah, that's a good point, Kevin. I think um, you can even say that with him, say that to Jeremy Macklin and if you give him an opportunity to be the number two guy, just rotate him in there. I mean, they play a nice rotation with the line. Maybe they'll do something like that with the wide receiver. I, 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 he's kind of a guy I've overlooked and we've gotten a little bit past the initial free agency here. So I think Jeremy Macklin is a good point you're bringing up. Um, in terms of Kalen Clay, I think he said a very interesting thing. He had a brief conference call with a couple of us in the media. Um, he said, you know, which really is something that's very true. Um, he's going to be able to get a look at the playbook now. I mean, he was here for four weeks and got cut and joined the team the week before the regular season. I mean, it, it takes a, you know, a couple of days to get a hold of the playbook. It takes a couple of days to get on, get on yes. pace with your quarterback. So I think Kalen Clay, maybe again, I'm with you four or five, maybe a super depth guy. I mean, I, I just said uh, the other day that I do not want to see Micah Hyde or Tredavious White even fielding punts in training camp. I mean, they were doing that last year. Leave leave my all-pro defenders away from that. Not to say that Kalen Clay is just a punching bag out there, but please, please. No, he was actually good at it, too. I mean, he returned one to the house in, in Carolina uh, when he went back there. I think they did, were expecting a little bit more in the return game, and that's what got him cut. Honestly, Nick, not his receiving ability. I actually think he's could develop a little bit. I actually – think he's a good person to have competing for a fifth or sixth job you know obviously you're going to give Andre Holmes your fifth job 
And, you know, do, does Dupree or Riley come out of nowhere to, to kind of compete with Clay? I think that's kind of how I look at it. Who's going to win that final receiving job? I think Clay does because he can play special teams. So that's just kind of how I look at him and Holmes. You know, they're going to dedicate you, a fifth oh, and six to special teams. Sorry, Kevin, I didn't mean to jump in there. But another guy to consider, too, they signed to a futures contract is Rod Streeter, who had really – you were in training camp, Kevin. Um, yes. I mean, he was – he was a guy that really stood out. Yeah, so, he had made the team. Yep. Yeah, he was he was going to be on the final roster. He got hurt. So maybe that's a guy they're depending on. But that's a pretty big roll of the dice to depend on Rod Scooter to come out again. And uh, while I said that maybe – Off an injury now this time. Yeah, off an injury. And, and, and while we're saying that, you know, maybe Zay will have some better chemistry with another quarterback, maybe Kalen Clay will have a chance to get on the same page with a new quarterback. Maybe Rod Streeter doesn't have as good chemistry as he had with Tyrod Taylor. Who knows? There's a lot of variables here. But he's an interesting guy to note, um, you know, because really, like you said, Kevin, I mean, there's really no way around it. He made the team last year. For he sure did. Yeah, he definitely did. Um, but it is, it is interesting. Like, I still kind of look at no matter what role you give Andre Holmes, I kind of look at him as the fifth special teamer and, and Kalen Clay, if he made the team as a punt returner slash receiver um, can kind of come in as a pinch and maybe continue to, to develop as a speed guy. It's more of a maybe, maybe kind of developing that gain role, maybe as a fifth, sixth guy there too. So I just, I just can't trust you know, right now. I mean, that would really put Rod Streeter. I still don't have a guy that's a third right now. So um, even if you're counting on clay and even if you're counting on, um, you know, Holmes a little bit, you got, you're counting on uh, Rod Streeter to be your third or fourth receiver. That's even, like, that's even bigger ask than last year. Um, so I, I think there's potential Rod Streeter can make this team. I think there's potential he can end up edging out for the fourth receiver job. Nick, I'm still a receiver short here. I'm still looking for a third receiver, even with Rod Streeter, Kalen Clay, uh, and Andre Holmes as your four through six, which is pretty uninspiring in the first place. Um, I'm still missing that third guy, and I just think it's an absolute necessity need. And if you if you're going to trade once again, three, four, five, six, seven assets. Like, when does this third receiver come or even second receiver think you need to make a move on Jeremy Macklin? I think you need to call him and say, hey, guy, you're going to be with a rookie quarterback. You know, he could be as good as any in this league. We want you here. You're going to be a number two. You're going to start from day one, $3 million. We wanted you last year. We still want you. Like, if you're going to want me, <laughs> if you're going to want me at my uh, best, you're going to want me at my worst, right, Nick? Yeah, uh, it, it, a good point on Macklin too again I really hadn't thought about him uh Kevin um this this regime wanted him uh, they definitely wanted him that's for sure and this is Brandon Bean now too it was post you know Doug Whaley interestingly enough I think too with Andre Holmes as well is of course he's there for a special team ability um you know they signed guys like like Raphael Bush he's gonna um contribute there Taiwan Jones is back we're gonna have some other guys there so I think he's gonna make the team Andre Holmes again with special yeah. because he did have a couple of touchdowns last year Kevin but really, it was almost kind of a funny, ironic thing how he had two touchdowns in the first three weeks. Um, he only had five catches in that span. He added another one in week eight against Oakland. But then eventually, it's almost like he, I think all of his touchdowns were one yard passes. Big targets, six foot four, six foot five. After week eight, they, around, that's when they got Kelvin Benjamin. So as a target, as a red zone target, Andre Holmes, they don't really need him there anymore. So it's going to be – could he be a, a maybe a guy at the end of training camp that, you know, maybe they let go and you can get someone else in there. Maybe he makes room for Macklin and a rookie. Yeah, of course, that's forward thinking all the way until the end of August there. But Yeah, I mean, you still save – he's still on the hook for $1.2 million of dead cap. Um, he's owed one point seven five, so you're going to save half a million dollars cutting him. I mean, that's an undrafted free agent that, you know, you're the last player on your roster you could kind of pay for by cutting him. So um, – I definitely think that that's possible. I don't think that he's a shoe in on this roster, especially adding Stanford um, as well for New York and still having Humber maybe going back to a more natural special teams, maybe even, even uh, Lorenzo in a more special teams role if the Bills address linebacker here uh, in the next couple of weeks. So there's a lot of special teams guys that Danny Crossman gets to play with. He gets just endless chances to, to develop his unit and to continue to play special teams football. So He's going to have a lot more players this year. I think that special teams unit is still pretty solid. They have a lot of players there that are specifically for special teams. I think it's time to go get me Macklin and a rookie. And then, you know, then I'm good again. Um, you know, once Decker is going on a visit tomorrow to Baltimore, who just seems to sign every single player ever um, at that at that group, or at least has first say. And then from there, like not, 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 not like Joe Flacco has the worst, you know, yards per completion or anything. But, um, 
you know, why don't we go play there? We're going to not go to other teams though. So if he's gone, you're, you're really just left with Macklin after that. It's guys that I don't know are much better than Holmes and, and Kalen clay. So to me, I think they make the move. They need to make a call. Maybe they already have. And they basically said, Hey man, you know, given, you know, we want you on this team. Maybe May 1st, we'll, we'll see how the draft goes, but like, I, I, someone's got to have a call into Macklin. It's been silent for his camp since he he was cut. So, I guess that's a that's a really good kind of place to leave it and kind of talk about tight ends for a brief moment. Um, tell us about who they had in town here for a visit. Yeah, Mike Gasecki, correct, Kevin? Am I saying? Yeah, that? that's 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 correct. Yeah, Gasecki. Um, I know. I know. Before we got on air here, we were we were tossing this back and forth because no. One yeah, was- I've heard of just Gasecki, Gasecki, or nope. Gasecki. So <laughs> it's kind of like kind of back and forth, like Darius Darius. Yeah, yeah. No one can pronounce our last names, Kevin, so no, uh, we're allowed to get these wrong. But sure. uh, we think we got it right here. <laughs> um, but, what, yeah. what range do you think he's he is as a tight end? Do you, do you look at him? I know, like, Jacksonville is hot on this guy in, at the end of the first round. Yeah, it's. I think um, – I, I may or may not, teasing to tomorrow's Buffalo football beat mock with, with us two and our, our pal Spencer German from Rock Sports Report, I might have him around that area going in the late in the first round. But okay. You, you you got Rob Gronkowski just making everybody think that any tight end with size is Rob Gronkowski, if you will. And, uh, of course, we got Tom Brady throwing you. It's a little bit easier than, than some other guys have it. But um, it's interesting because they the Bills, of course, picked up Nick O'Leary. He was an exclusive rights free agent. Most of those guys usually get picked up anyways. Mm. But, um, I think I, I wouldn't mind it. I mean – Kevin, I'll let you take away Charles Clay's cap situation. Um, I think he's on the hook um, for his dead cap would be a pretty big hit, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, his whole salary, yep. Whole salary, yep, until next year, right? Correct, yep. So he's the second highest paid player on the team, uh, $9 million, only base of 4.5. So the Bills are going to look at that and say, we only owe the guy 4.5 in cash, and he's going to already count $9 million on the cap. There's not much that they can do there. They'd literally be paying another team to not have him on their roster. I think he's more valuable than that. Um, next year's the first year you can kind of like half consider it, but I still think he might. He would have a 4.5 dead cap in 2019, and with all their money, I still think that he'd probably play that final year out and or restructure and or extend. Um, so that's kind of his cap situation. You're, you're on the hook. There's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. So Gasecki here, I think would be, you know, he, he's a guy that you'd want to get out there. He's, he's a pass tight end. He's a pass catching tight end. He's a playmaker from the tight end position um, from all accounts. So it's, it's pretty interesting. I mean, but you do see teams, of course, you know, first famous with, as you know, prior mentioned, Rob Murkowski and Aaron Hernandez were really the two first dual tight end threat, which was a pretty big deal in the NFL in recent years. Um, so you do see those two. If you're looking at it, from that aspect, um, you know, do you want the Bills to have dual tight end pass threats uh, down the middle? Um, if I have course, a rookie quarterback, I kind of do, right? That's exactly. That was going to be the next line out of my mouth, Kevin. When you got a rookie quarterback, it's not the worst idea. But if the, it depends, again, so much depends on – we were talking about the wide receivers. What are the Bills going to do at wide receiver uh, via the draft? Well, we don't know what picks they're going to have right now because we're, we're, we're pretty sure a lot of speculation as the Bills trading up. But that, of course, means a lot of their, a lot of a lot of this is going to change here. If Jasaki's mocked to go later in the first round, early in the second round, will he be around when the Bills are there? I mean, the Locked On Podcast Network is excited to announce our expansion to Major League Baseball. Let me introduce you to the new host of Locked On Reds. This is James Erpine of ESPN 1530 in Cincinnati, your host of the Locked On Reds podcast. It's your go-to source for daily coverage of the Cincinnati Reds. Join me every day as we dissect all of the news and break down everything that's happening with and around the Reds this season. Make sure you keep it locked on Locked On Reds for your daily Reds fix. Subscribe to Locked on Reds on iTunes, Spotify, or whatever podcast catcher you use. It's the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day, now with Major League Baseball. I see him everywhere on draft boards. I've seen him as high as like 25th and probably as low as like 50th. So it's going to be interesting um, to where he does go, and I do believe he's going to jump in the first. But it's, it is an interesting tight end year where there's three guys that are all potential first-round picks. Not every year do you can you say that. I mean, you got Hayden Hurst out of South Carolina, 6'4", 250. 
um, you know, rumored in the top 30. Then you also have Dallas Godard from South Dakota State, um, you know, rumored to be the best of all three of them. So 6'4", 256. So you have some size. You have some, some, some nice weight there that, that can play the tight end inline position. There's a, there's a couple of options, Nick, if they're looking to make a move and, and they're trying to say, Kevin, well, guess what? You know, maybe we don't have the, the great wide receiver talent you, you're, you're talking about on your show, but we do have Charles Clay, who's a very capable player. And then we're going to, you know, we're going to spend an asset on this tight end position. I mean, I don't think that that's crazy. I don't think it's crazy either, Kevin. I mean, I'm, uh, I don't hate Nick O'Leary, but I don't think he's, I think a lot of people like him and I'm not even trying to sound silly here. I think a lot of people like him because he doesn't wear gloves. And I think they think that's old school. Just a blue collar guy, you know, carries his lunch pail. He gets down and dirty, whatever term you want to use. That's him. Uh, as a, you know, grandpa is a famous golfer. And I, I just think he's a third tight end. Like I don't, I fine with him on the roster. I'm fine with him on special teams. I'm fine with him in certain packages. I think you put him at the third tight end. You have Charles Clay in there as like a one, a one B and then you draft the guy. I think that's a much better unit. Yeah, I would completely agree there, and I know this doesn't make for good, uh, good podcast or good radio, if you will. But I'm, I've never been a huge fan of Nick O'Leary. I mean, he, two touchdowns last year were his first two touchdowns of his career, and everyone loved him before then. Um, so I just think that the backstory really people fell in love with, and I just, I like to see more from my, my, my tight end position. It's, it's certainly evolved in recent years, as we mentioned, and Charles Clay is on the hook for quite a bit. Um, Unfortunately, I think the both of these units are pretty straightforward, so that's why you're going to hear a lot of agreement. Um, I don't think either of these position groups are going to cause like a fury of debate, right? Yeah, they definitely more to be desired. I mean, even Charles Clay, I mean, with his knee injuries, you, you hope. I mean, being in the locker room with him as I am a, a couple of days a week, uh, having Charles Clay is like just another – I know he wasn't around. He wasn't a big like, guy, if you will, but Charles Clay is one of the nicest guys in the room. He's he always he's he's weirdly enough one of the guys who asks you how you're doing before you ask them and you're the media member. So yeah, no, I've I've heard that from him. He's actually took the time out to to sign my wife's hat and do a couple of other things. I remember. Yeah. Um, so he's definitely a good guy. So he's definitely a, a processy guy. Is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, he's not going anywhere. I mean, it just and if you try to use it like an argument against it, like I'll argue you because like you're just going to give him you paying him nine million dollars in the cap. Like why isn't he your tight end this year? Um, exactly. Oh, yeah, so I, that's, that's what Whaley did. He left him in this kind of situation, and he's your tight end. So he's, that doesn't mean you can't add another one. Um, yeah, but, it doesn't mean you can't, certainly can't, but it's it's so interesting, as you, as you said, with there are so many Gronk-type guys. It seems like in recent years there's been one. Three guy, of them. That, yeah, it seems like in recent years there's been, oh, this one guy could be the next Gronk. Do you, does your team want him? And this year's, you know, really, yeah, uh, Dallas Goder is the guy who kind of was early on jumping off um, – the, the, the page to me, but I think Jacecki, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think at the combine, he had the, the stellar combine, right? Didn't he have like a ridiculous? Yeah, he just absolutely oh. tore it up. Like there was no discussions that like he went from a second round pick to like probably a first. Yeah, just crazy numbers at the, at the combine. And um, hey, uh, if the Bills want to go there and they, you know, take care of what they need to take care of under center, uh, I, I, I wouldn't be mad about Buck Jacecki. Yeah. I mean, his combine was was unbelievable. And Indy did it with Luck and, and Kobe Fleener, so it's it is a thing that can be done in in one draft alone, like your top pick. So I wouldn't count it out to give someone a safety valve like that. Um, it's definitely a, I would say you could see freaking they keep addressing defense and really only go linebacker, and the rest of the draft could be line, uh, offense. So I do think that they've addressed um, the rest of their defensive line. I do think that there's a whole a big hole at linebacker, but they are signing Philip. They did sign Philip Gaines to be their nickel. Whether you like it, you hate it, you, you're somewhere in the middle. Um, that's what the unit's pretty much built, except for one linebacker. Is that is that how you kind of interpret this, Nick? Uh, can you say that again, there, uh, Kevin? Sorry, you, you broke up a little bit. The defense. Do you kind of interpret that as pretty much completed outside of one linebacker hole? Um, or what do you see there, at least in terms of the draft? In terms of the draft, I mean. Definitely linebacker. I mean, Lorenzo Alexander, um, he's there, I think, definitely more for his leadership than he is for his on-field play. I mean, he just seemed like a, I don't want to say one-hit wonder, but his his role just the beginning of that Rex Ryan defense, I mean, he even cooled off that season two years ago. Um, So I think that the Bills could use even two linebackers, Kevin. Okay. You know, I I don't I hate saying it because he's he's again a good guy and he's he's certainly a guy 
mentioned by the staff, I mean, at the, at the um, owner's meeting, excuse me, I almost said combine, at the owner's meeting, McDermott just a few weeks ago mentioned Lorenzo Alexander. He wasn't even asked um, really about, he was asked about Kyle and the importance of, and having those guys, Kyle and Lorenzo, he wants those guys. I don't think Lorenzo's going anywhere, but it was interesting earlier that you mentioned, you know, Lorenzo, since you're on special teams. I remember talking to him last year as for early as training camp. Lorenzo still loves to be a special teams guy. Exactly. I think that's where you see him. I mean, I think in that's a perfect where- world, I think you have him not starting in the starting lineup. I don't think that this team, especially trading assets, <laughs> has even close to the ability to – I don't think Philip Gaines should be a starter in this league. I think he's a good Sharice Wright type of fourth corner replacement level guy, but he's going to be your nickel. Yeah, yeah, no, that's – that's agreeable. I know where the most interesting, I think, question in regards to the linebacker position, uh, Kevin, would be, do you see Matt Milano moving to middle? Do you think that is something that can happen? Because I, I think they should leave him where he is. But yeah, I don't, I don't think there's even a question that you keep him at, at strong. Um, I, I think that he's going to be that Ramon Humber role that, that McDermott had. I mean, I think Humber's behind him now. So that's a good, good first step. Um, just give him the just give a job to Milano. Uh, let Humber and and Alexander play special teams once again. Like the way that this defense plays, I don't. There's fifty percent nickel on the field or more, right? Like you're talking about sixty percent of the time you're laying in two linebacker. Um, so I mean, they're going to fill one of those linebacker spots. It's almost a guarantee. Um, you really just have a lot of guys competing for the other one for sixty percent of plays, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think Ramon Humber. You mentioned him. I think he's a he seemed like a good locker room guy. Um, he certainly didn't make a big deal about losing his job to Milano. Um, he left some more to be desired. He did have a hand injury, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, last season a bit. Um, he's going to be, I think, a good, solid depth guy. But uh, as I said at the, at the top of the linebacker discussion, Kevin, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the Bills, they, who knows, barring trade again, maybe they trade a first, future first, and they still have their first uh, at, in, in the, at 22. Um, maybe they go linebacker there, and I can see them maybe hoping they land another Milano, another late round linebacker, and just have three young guys out there uh, roaming the linebacking uh, uh, position. And I mean, that'd be that'd be pretty something to have a, a couple of young guys out there and be set for a, a while. Hopefully, not. Gonna well, work. it's Darian O'Daniel time. Uh, Dorian O'Daniel from Clemson. He's been rumored to be, you know, going on a few visits. I mean, he's probably your fifth round pick. Um, so. Dorian O'Daniel could be a guy that they're going to try to fit into that Milano slash special teams role. So definitely, I mean, I could see that happening um, as well as a first, but I don't see two assets being spent. I mean, I guess a fifth you can consider an asset, but I don't think that this team has the ability to spend two assets at the linebacker spot as much as I agree that they should. Um, talking about the, you know, lastly here, talking about their their assets. There's been rumors, of course, that, you know, there's this rumor this week that they're discussed trading up with the Bucs at pick seven as per, you know, Buffalo football beat as well covered. Uh, Sean McDermott basically went on a Philadelphia podcast and said, we're going to make the necessary moves to try to get us there. Uh, you know, whatever that can be interpreted as talk, kind of talk about both of those a little bit. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. Uh, Kevin, as, as you alluded to, um, I, I picked up on his name was, I think, uh, Kevin, he is, his name was Kevin, excuse me, not not you, sorry. Um, it was Kevin Eskin, I think it was. I think uh, Howard Eskin, right? Howard, Howard Eskin, excuse me. Yeah, where, where did I find Kevin from? You're Kevin, but sorry, bud. Um, Howard Eskin, he's um, some sideline reporter, whatever. McDermott, 10 years with the Eagles? It sounded like it didn't. He didn't. I was really listening to the whole thing. He was, McDermott was about maybe 20. 22 minutes of this whole Eskin podcast. McDermott was on for like eight minutes, I would say. But I was listening to the whole thing, and I was hoping, Howard, you didn't tell me where you talked to Sean. It sounded like it was probably maybe even as far back as the combine. It seemed like there's a lot of people in the background. I'm not sure if you listened to it, Kevin. But Howard um, was uh, uh, talking to Sean, and Sean just was very open about – and I, I don't I, – I, I hate being called the speculative, you know, reporter or whatever – but this is word for word what Sean McDermott, McDermott said about the quarterback position. Of course, they were explaining, you know, do you like Carson Wentz? Because it's a Philly show. Do you like Carson Wentz? Do you like Nick Foles? Blah, blah, blah. Yes, he likes him. He said, Sean McDermott, always trying to keep, they're always trying to do the right thing. Him and Brandon Bean. I've got a vision in my mind. Our general manager, myself and Brandon Bean, we've got a vision for what we want, 
what we want it to look like, smell like, taste like, and feel like. And until we get there, we're going to do the necessary or make the necessary moves to try and get us there. I mean, Sean, everyone is talking about you trading up. And he said, we're going to do the necessary or make the necessary moves to try and get us there. I mean, Kevin, they got to be trading up, right? I mean, we thought they were trading up. That's the closest I've heard Sean McDermott say, yeah, we're thinking about trading up again. Of course, he loves he loves. Yeah, AJ. that's the least a Belzy line he's ever given, really, um, in his tenure, in my opinion, from what I've done following him. So that's interesting. And then you couple that with that Chad Forbes from the NFL draft bites um, does seem to have a little bit of a beat on this and, and said, you know, they could be interested in Tampa Bay at seven. That's kind of what we were talking about off air and kind of what I've always felt was the right spot for him um, to trade up. So no one, no, no one's saying number two, um, but I would I'm actually not behind number two. How, how do you feel on getting as high as two Nick? I don't think that two is realistic. And I think you can just tell Kevin by the speculation. I mean, God love Buffalo fans. I mean, we're from Western New York, Kevin. And my my favorite pastime of Buffalo fans, whether it be Sabres fans, whether it be Bills fans, is, well, why don't we throw Shaq Lawson into the deal? They'll want him. Guy, just because you want to get rid of somebody doesn't mean he has all of a sudden has value. Like, you want to get rid of him because you don't like him. You think he's a bum. I don't think Shaq's a bum. I thought he was okay last year. Not a first-round pick, actually, but that's a talk for another day. They think they can just throw around when they start throwing stuff at, at the wall and seeing what sticks. That's when you know it's not going to happen. So number two, I just think it's out of the Bills' reach right now. I mean, I think it's unrealistic. Brandon Bean even said that if he's going to trade to two, and it's and it's likely, maybe he. I shouldn't say likely. Maybe it's a chance that this could happen, Kevin, because he knows Dave Gettleman. They have a relationship. So maybe he says, "Hey, if I can get this pick from the Broncos, could we all consider this one trade?" And boom, boom, instantly, because he. He said, Brandon Bean said at the owner's meeting, he wants to have both trades set in stone before he makes the first one. But as you alluded to, number seven, I think somewhere in that four to eight range, which is where number number seven is Tampa Bay. I think that area there, I think that's the bread and butter for the Bills. might only take a seven, Nick. Might, or excuse me, might only take a second, Nick, to do that. Um, I think that is easier and the Bills at the same time they have so many holes still. I mean, we've talked about in this quick 20, 30 minute podcast, we've talked about like three or four positions, Kevin. There's so many holes. And one position having no wide receiver and linebacker having needing two yeah, <laughs> um, exactly. to a piece. Um, so, so to get to seven and you throw a second in there, maybe to get to maybe four or five and only throw their first two uh, first round picks at it, I should say. How about, I mean, I'm just going to leave this here. And I, I know it was just, it was a couple of years ago um, and it was just for a, uh, a receiver, but the Rams moved up from 16 to eight and it costed them just a second cost to them, just a second round pick, pick 46, uh, 16 to eight bills with 12 can go up to seven. And I just think the team's going to say, here's 12, here's 53. Who's going to take a set pick seven or pick eight? We don't care which one. We're not really thinking or see uh, a quarterback's going to go there, right? I mean, I, I think that that's got to be the play. You hold on to 22 and you hold on to 56 and you hold on to two thirds. Isn't that the way to do this? That's, I think, absolutely. Yes. We're again on the same page here, unfortunately. I, yeah, I, I don't know. Some people love to trade to two. So, I mean, we're not going to have an argument here today, but um, a lot of people do, Nick. They like that trade to two. I don't. I'll argue anybody about that. I just think that you're trading away everything and leaving your team with nothing. Um, and this is definitely not a team that can do that. Uh, that's oh, no, that's, that's the challenge with the Giants. Why aren't they going to take a quarterback at two, Nick? Why aren't the Giants going to? Yeah. I just think that they, they from everything that Gettleman said, um, everything that that organization has said, they are just, I think, seemingly just still in love with Eli. And I okay. almost think in a weird way, way you know you, you again like we just said with McDermott we're not going to ever get an answer unless somehow he's talking to Howard Eskin the Eagle side sideline reporter um I think that the Giants possibly feel like they owe it to Eli after letting him get his streak snapped last year after allowing him to be benched last year I think they feel like they might owe it to him I, I and I, I know that might sound crazy it's the NFL it's a business but I mean, I, I, to me, that makes sense that they, they're, they're trying to, you know, pat Eli in the back and tell him it's okay, we need you for a couple more years. Okay, fair enough. Um, what a great addition here today, and there's a lot of great heavy-hitting content that 
You know, we're so glad to bring you. We're going to have some special guests on next week, Nick. And I'm thinking, I don't know yet. I'm thinking about maybe having that Chad Forbes guy on here. I don't know. Let me, let me try to reach out to him. I'm interested. I want to hear some trade up talk from, from people just completely outside of um, Buffalo and completely outside of the media, outside of fans, outside of everything. Uh, I just want to know what people are thinking around the league and thinking how serious the bills are and what position they think they're going to trade up to um, was just reported last leave here for the day. Uh, Frank Ragnow, um, 260 or excuse me, 2,600 snaps, zero sacks allowed. He's having dinner tonight with Juan Castillo. Um, so, and this, it has a workout for tomorrow. So, uh, it's a sneaky pick for, for the second first round pick, Nick. Like we were just saying, Kevin, there are plenty of holes to fill on this Bills In center. Although um, they have two there that you might be able to take a competent player out of that. Uh, Juan Castillo could still have his way and be thinking center at 53, 56, or even as high as I, I do see him as a second round pick personally. Do you have any opinion on him? Uh, I, until our friend Ryan Kelvin just tweeted that out, uh, Kevin, I have, and I'm going to have to dig into uh, uh, Frank a little bit here, but interestingly enough, um, Brian Talbot from New York Upstate, he, his report here uh, from the Arkansas Center uh, mentions Juan Castillo. And every time you, you hear about Juan, you've just heard just, just great reviews from guys. I mean, when R- Russell Bodine signed with the Bills, I mean, that was exactly, you just heard all about Juan and, and, and how important he was to. to, 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 to pass, pass, uh, pass protection is the most important thing for Juan, I think. Seriously. Yeah, yeah. Right. It just it just seems like he Juan it just has to be so respected in this league and it's 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 not to give away something that I'm going to be looking to to dig into but that's something I think I'm looking to dig into because you've just heard recently so many so many good things about him from around the league and it's uh it's it's going to be interesting I mean of course if he's if he's getting the respect of these guys from around the league um, I don't think it's far fetched to say that he has very high respect from the Bills brass so. Uh, if he gets the if Frank uh, Ragnow gets the uh, you know yep, six five three twelve from Arkansas Nick six five three twelve from Arkansas. If he gets the the uh, green light from Juan Castillo, I mean it, that's that's a that's a possibility I think for the Bills. Like you said, uh, second third round area. Yeah, I see him as high really as thirty three on some lists, and um, you know somewhere in the fifties sixties range. So definitely think he's a surefire second. So it just depends if you can wait. Or if that might be a guy, you see the Bills name uh, pop up on the screen in the early second round and you don't know what they're doing. And you see Frank Ragnow come across, could be a 10-year center though. Uh, one of the best center groups and in, uh, interior offensive line groups in a while. So I wouldn't be shocked to see him plug and play. I don't know what they're going to do with three centers. Maybe they do view Groy somewhere else. But Nick, man, we're going to have to get into that a little bit more on a different show. Um, once again... I'm Kevin Misery. I'm glad to be on here giving you some heavy hitting content on your local Bills experts. Nick Woten, part of uh, Locked On Bills now, is our Thursday guy, um, Thursday co-host, as well as you know we're trying to get some guests on here. Nick, we want we want some some really heavy hitting content. Nick, really appreciate having you on today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Kevin. I'm looking forward to uh, staying with Locked On Bills now here for for the foreseeable future. And thanks for coming on. Okay, I've heard you. I will not tell that machine made by Amazon with a female's name to play a locked on podcast, but you can do it. You can tell your to play program locked on whatever your favorite is. And I promise I won't say, okay, that big, huge mammoth brand that makes all sorts of things play podcast such and such anymore. I've heard you. But just let you know, you can do it. You can play all of your Locked On Podcast Networks on your smart home devices. The Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and now just about everywhere.